Well, welcome back to the construction zone. Got a couple more weeks in the construction, construction zone as we wrap up this series, but I appreciate your engagement with it as we continue to look at the book of Titus. To, to put the context to this again, young Pastor Titus had some daunting challenges as he began ministry on the Mediterranean island of Crete. Quite frankly, the church was a mess. It was a mess because they, had, they didn't have qualified leadership. Uh, there was the perversion of sound teaching and general spiritual immaturity on the part of the church members. And so Paul sent this young man to make improvements. And in two broad categories that we're talking about, the thing that he was to do was to develop the leadership and disciple the membership. First thing we've talked about is the whole issue of leadership, develop the leadership. And now we're moving into that section, we're talking about discipling the membership. You may have heard this description of preaching before, and I think it's pretty good. Uh, good preaching comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. Pretty good, isn't it? Comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. Today's message fits into that second category. So if, uh, we're going to do some disturbing today, and if I do this right, I should be able to offend most of you. Okay, so kind of prepare yourself uh, for that. I've capsulized this passage into two things that will help take you from wherever you are toward greater maturity in Christ. And those two things are act your age and play your position. Act your age and play your position. The first section gives us a kind of graded curriculum which Titus was to teach to four age groups in the church. We sometimes assume that younger people are naturally immature and older ones are automatically mature. Truth be told, however, age alone doesn't equal maturity. Paul's first piece of advice is this, act your age. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus. We actually get into the second chapter today after all this week. And it kind of sounds like he's setting up age and gender-specific seminars, starting with the men whom I will call respectable patriarchs. Teach the older men, verses 1 and 2. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Now, I define an older man as anybody who is older than I am. Anybody who's balder than I am, try that. Grayer hair, thicker glasses, more liver spots, always drives with a left turn signal on. You know who you are. Someone said that old folks are worth a fortune. Silver in their hair, gold in their teeth, stones in their kidneys, lead in their feet, and gas in their stomach. Some of you are rich today. I used to think that was a lot funnier than I do today. In this context, I believe we can define an older man as someone whose children, if he has them, are nearly raised and out on their own. And by definition, I am an older man. Now let's assume that an older man is somewhere between his mid-50s, kind of where I am, and 100, all right? So the idea of a patriarch is a man who by age and wisdom qualifies as being fatherly. He qualifies as being fatherly, fatherly in the home, in the church, in the community, or even in business. So to all my fellow old geezers, these are the things which we should be concentrating on if we're going to act our age, if we're going to become more spiritually mature. And he lists a few of these qualities. This is a good checkpoint for us guys. First of all, be temperate, he says. That means not given to excess in anything. In food, uh, alcohol, leisure, hobbies, spending, or work. It's balanced living. Temperate is balanced living. Guys, is there any area of your life where you go overboard, where you live in excess? If you can't think of any, ask your wives. Be worthy of respect. Also translated, this is interesting, grave. There's a word we don't use too much anymore, like in, in this context. Uh, kind of morbid sounding, but it means dignified. Gray temples, wears wingtip shoes. Anybody remember what wingtip shoes are? Old guys used to wear wingtip shoes. Former President George H.W. Bush thought he was worthy of more respect 
after being knighted by Queen Elizabeth. He said, I asked Elizabeth how she liked me married to a knight. She said, Sir George, make the coffee. Job 12.12. 12. Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? Well, you can only hope that age would bring understanding and wisdom. Too many men back off rather than bear down with age when it comes to serving the Lord. We have a tendency to buy more toys, to join more clubs, to take more trips, take up more hobbies, wear more jewelry, and accept less responsibility in the kingdom of God. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker. I may be getting older, but I refuse to grow up. If you're 50, don't try to recapture your 20s. Grow up. Act your age. This doesn't mean you can't enjoy yourself, but don't become an overgrown kid who literally lives for fun and games. You just might be approaching the peak of your influence for Christ if you are a maturing man. Now, speaking uh, rather personally at this point, I can tell you that I have never enjoyed a season of life more than the one I'm enjoying today. And I turned 70 on Thursday. Can you believe that? I know that's a surprise to all of you. But I've never enjoyed a season of life more than this one, and I've never enjoyed a season of ministry more than the one that I'm in today. I think of a couple old people that I've respected through the years. Corey Ten Boom was one. Another one was Vance Havner. I had an opportunity to <clears throat> hear them and be ministered to them by, uh, by them when they were in their 80s. And one of the things that they said was that they were attracting more and more young people. Young people seemed to crave the wisdom of people in their 80s who continue to be engaged in life and continue to be engaged in ministry. Your kids, your grandchildren, younger Christians, business associates that just might be attracted to and seek out advice from older men who demonstrate true dignity. Be self-controlled. That means sensible. Sensible is the opposite of senile. Now, I know that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are physiological conditions over which older people have no control, but too many other aging people simply stop thinking, stop learning, stop growing. The challenge here, guys, for us is to remain mentally sharp by continuing to learn, emotionally healthy by interacting with other people, spiritually sensitive by maintaining the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines of a quiet time with God. Older men, be sound in faith. In Greek, this literally says, in the faith. Be sound in the faith. When we talk about faith, we're talking about our capacity to trust God, but we're also talking about the body of truth contained in the Bible, an understanding, a grasp on the Word of God. We need to be sound in our faith. <clears throat> As a young pastor and seminary student, I filled in for our uh, senior pastor at a Wednesday night Bible study one time, and it was mostly senior citizens who came to that. And uh, rather than giving an hour's lecture, which is what our pastor tended to do, I, being a whippersnapper, decided we'd do things differently. Even back then, I was doing things differently. So I decided to uh, break down this large group into smaller groups, and I prepared some questions and applications from the text that we're studying. And I remember asking for feedback after we you know, given them these questions, and they were kind of talking among themselves. And one man spoke up, and I don't know how old he was. He was probably about my age now. Uh, had been a member of that church for probably 40 years. And he responded something like this. I, I don't think any one of us in this room is qualified to answer these kind of questions. That's what we pay you ministers to do for us. And I thought, whoa, we've somehow missed the point. There was an older man, I believe, who was not sound in the faith. Not sound in the faith. I love talking with older men who study the Bible, who find new insights and challenge me to trust in a God who has never failed them. The older I get, the harder it is to find men like that. 
One of the most touching things I ever heard came from a, young, a younger pastor who had the opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Billy Graham. Oh, that's pretty heady stuff. One-on-one -on -one time with Billy Graham. And obviously he was expecting and thinking that he was going to receive some tremendous wisdom from this great follower of Christ. And he said, Billy Graham handed his Bible to me and he said, young man, feed me from this book. Share something with me from this book. There's a wise old man. There's a wise old man. Be sound in love. Love is tenderness. It's compassion. It's understanding. Too many older men get grumpier, more critical, more judgmental, bitter, and even vindictive with age. Intolerant of children. Intolerant of new ideas. Intolerant of new methods. Senior citizens can tend to live self-consumed lives rather than investing in others. And the people who do that are the loneliest, most miserable people around because their world gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As we get older, loving relationships should become even more important to us. And if relationships are going to become more important to us, it means that we're going to have to be flexible rather than fixed on our ways. Be sound in endurance. When our body starts slowing down due to age, we have a tendency to become more complacent. Complacent physically, mentally, spiritually. We can actually, I think, speed up the aging process, becoming old before our time, acting like invalids before we actually are invalids. I like the attitude of uh, one of Lois's uncles. He was in his late 80s and he was suffering from a lot of different issues, but one of them was arthritis in his knees. He was a big man, tall man. And uh, very uh, formal and dignified in his bearing. He got around the retirement home <clears throat> on one of these electric scooters. You'd, you had to be kind of careful because you could be run over in this retirement home from all the scooters going back and forth. So when we came into uh, <clears throat> their apartment, Lois and I did, he started to get up. He was in his uh, big chair there, and he started to get up because, you know, that's what you do. That's what gentlemen do. They, they stand up, especially when a lady comes into the room. And so he started to stand up, and I said... Uh, Adolf, that's, it's okay, you don't have to do that, you can remain seated. I said, have you ever thought about getting one of those chairs that actually has a little launch thing to it to kind of help you out of the chair? And they said, ha, those are for old people. I love that attitude. Men, if you're healthy enough to be here today, <clears throat> and you can understand what I'm talking about, it's too soon for you to give in to old age. Don't you dare give in to that. Bethel is fortunate to have many older men who model maturity. You know who they are. You know who you are. Many of them, by the way, I've been really encouraged at the Aspire training on Sunday night that we've had a number of older men who have come out to that rather than saying, well, that's just for the young bucks. They're out there as well learning. If, you, if it took courage for a young Pastor Titus to speak to the older men like that, just imagine how brave he had to be to address this next group of Christians whom I'm referring to as reverent matriarchs. Reverent matriarchs, verse 3. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Now, I realize that no woman wants to be called an older woman. And as I look around this auditorium today, I don't see one older woman here. Isn't that fantastic? But just in case some of you might know an older woman, you may want to pass on some of these insights. Like older men, we're going to define this as someone whose children are raised on their own from the mid-50s and older. But if you have a question, don't ask. I can imagine, Titus... <clears throat> announcing a special seminar. Again, this is a young pastor. Uh, I'd like to meet after church today. I'd like to meet with all the older women. Get together in the quad. And if he was smart, he would have set up round tables and had fancy claws and some flowers and maybe made up fancy name tags and served tea with low-fat cookies. Going to meet with the older women. And I can almost see the beads of sweat on his forehead and hear a, a slight tremor in his voice, <clears throat> as he advises these women in these areas, first of all, he says, be reverent. 
be reverent. Literally, this means to be involved in sacred, holy things. The patron saint of older women could certainly be that dear lady for whom we named our oldest daughter. Her name is Anna. Luke chapter 2. Many of you are familiar with this. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming to them, that is to Mary and Joseph, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Regardless of your age or stage in life, there's no more important pursuit for an older woman than to be a prayer warrior. I mentioned my mother periodically. I talked to her again last week. She's 96 years old, living in Southern California. And once again, as we were talking, she assured me, she said, I pray for you every day. Now, every night she prays that she'll go to be with Jesus. And it's not because she's depressed, and it's not because she's terribly sick. She's just ready to go and be with Jesus. But I know why she's still here, because I still need her prayer support. That's what she does. Don't be slanderers. The Greek word is, get this for slanderer, diabolos. Wow. You know what diabolos is, don't you? It's the word from which we get the word devil. Because he is the accuser of the brethren. Don't be slanderous. In far too many churches, the older women's sewing circles have sown more seeds of discord than patches on quilts. Maybe because they have more time on their hands. Maybe they're bitter about getting older, and so they strike out at those who have so much of what they, they miss. They miss their youth, their health, their beauty, their mobility. And I have to tell you that more than a few churches and ministries and pastors have been destroyed by the unguarded, cruel speech of some older women. Ladies, when you gather for projects, when you gather for fellowship or prayer, make sure it's for mutual edification rather than character assassination or church criticism. Don't let that gathering time be a cesspool. Let it be a time when the grace of Jesus Christ is shared in abundance. Don't be addicted to wine. I read a while back that unlike men, most alcoholic women became addicted after the age of 50. Now we can only guess, but perhaps it's because they struggled with a sense of purposelessness after the nest was empty. Society places great pressures on women today to be superwomen. Caring wife, efficient homemaker, perfect parent, successful career person, faithful jazzercise, literally a living doll. It's enough to drive anybody to drink. Teachers of what is good. Proverbs 31, you know that dreaded chapter in the Bible, women, you're very familiar with it. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Older women, into whose life are you building Christian virtues? Into whose life are you building Christian virtues? We had a great ministry at our church in Portland called Heart to Heart. What it was was older women mentoring younger ones. Now, there were always more younger women wanting to be mentored than there were older women available to mentor them. And I personally think that ministry was just as, if not more important than anything else that was going on in our women's ministry. That includes retreats and teas and group studies and movies and all kinds of wonderful things that women's ministries did and does. But that connection between older women and younger women is downright biblical. It's biblical to do that. I can't think of a more profound women's ministry than that. I've met some very godly women here at Bethel, who have and could be available for this profound ministry. One of the things that I appreciate about the Mothers of Preschool ministry is that they have this group called the Mentor Moms. The Mentor Moms. The older women, the older wives and mothers and grandmothers who sit at the various tables just to be a resource for the young women who are there. 
In this next section, Paul lays out a curriculum, as it were, for older women to use in teaching uh, younger women to become responsible homemakers. Responsible homemakers. Look at verses 4 and 5. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the Word of God. Responsible homemakers. Now, if Titus was on shaky ground talking about older men and older women, he's walking through a minefield when he gets to this one. And so am I. What does the Bible say that older women need to teach younger women? They need to teach younger women to be husband lovers. And all the men said? Oh, that was pretty weak. Be husband lovers. Too many Christian women even are searching the Scriptures looking for escape clauses in their marriage vows. They're looking for exceptions to everything the Bible has to say about the important season in their life that we're talking about right now. We need to seek out, you need to seek out that godly older woman who has a track record, an excellent track record as a wife Ask for advice, ask for her prayer support, and let her hold you accountable. <clears throat> Young women, does everyone around you know that you are totally devoted to your husband? Does everyone around know that you're totally devoted to your husband? What does your tone of voice, your body language say about that? How do you speak about your husband in public? How do you speak to him in private? At the risk of sounding hokey, maybe you need to get out that old Tammy Wynette song. And if I still had a voice, I'd sing it for you. Stand by your man. Wah, wah. Be husband lovers. And be children lovers. It's easy for young mothers to love their children when the baby is clean and cooing, or the kindergartner makes the I love mommy card. But what mother hasn't had her love tested by a sick, cranky, unruly, teething, demanding child who won't give her a moment's rest. Child abuse is never justifiable, but I want to tell you it is understandable when you are sleep deprived for a long period of time. You can lose it. You can lose it at moments like that. Blessed is the young mother who has an older woman on speed dial for when she gets to the end of her emotional rope, to just kind of tell that to the older woman and have the older woman say, I understand. I understand. And I will pray for you. Be self-controlled means sensible. We saw this trait earlier in our study related to elders and said that it means to live a balanced life. <clears throat> now that's a tall order for a young mother with children at her feet trying to squeeze in a quiet time, romance with her husband, church ministry, physical fitness, personal time, and maybe a career outside the home. But cheer up, young women. Your kids will not be toddlers forever. Eventually, they'll be teenagers. You have so much to look forward to. Even though it's hard to live a balanced life during these years, don't give up trying. You need the spiritual food, as well as the adult human contact. Be pure. Now, I'm not going to rant and rave here about Facebook or talk shows or women's magazines, romance novels or soap operas. Filling your mind and time with those things can build dissatisfaction with your life or at least distraction from focusing on the Lord and the godly virtues. Remember this practical instruction that we covered it when we studied the book of Philippians in terms of what we do with our mind, what we put into our, our mind, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Be busy at home. The Bible does not say that a wife or mother should never work outside the home. The woman that we read about in Proverbs 31 uh, worked in real estate, investments, and retail sales. But this energetic, creative, resourceful woman 
never does it to the detriment of her husband, her children, or her home. So young mothers, if due to financial or emotional need, you've got to work outside the home, you can do it with a clear conscience as long as your career doesn't take priority over your home. Doesn't take priority over your home. If that strikes a nerve, search your heart, talk to your husband, and seek counsel from a godly older woman. Be busy at home. Be kind. That has to do with deeds of kindness. We read about some of those with Dorcas. Remember her in the book of Acts? Not all young women are seamstresses. Not all of them are gourmet chefs or gracious hostesses. But each one of you can extend kind words, smiles, small gifts, or cards to those around you who need a lift to just be kind. And I think those things mean even more when they come from the busiest people on the planet, young mothers. Be subject to your husbands. God has built order into the home, just as he built order into the church, and that order includes leadership and followership. His design is that the husband and father is the loving leader of his home, and the wife and mother is his supportive helper. Please don't let the exceptions and the extremes of gender roles keep you from observing God's plan for your marriage and your family, and I know that there can be large discussions and covering all the what-ifs, all the yabbits, but eventually we always need to go back to the Word of God, don't we? And say, what does the Bible say? And the Bible says, wives, be helpers to your husbands as they lead. There's one more group of Christians who need to act their age, which I'm calling reliable promise keepers. This has to do with the Young men. Let's pick it up in verse 6. Similarly, uh, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. This is the age and stage that Titus, I think, could relate to. I think that these would have been his peers, young men. One of the most rewarding experiences of my ministry was the time spent in discipling relationships with several of my peers at that time when we were in our 20s and 30s. And I had several men that I met with regularly for study and scripture memorization, sharing our lives and prayer. We used uh, tools like Design for discipleship from the navigators and transferable concepts from Campus Crusade for Christ. Many of these men eventually became spiritual leaders in our church or they became spiritual leaders in other churches and other ministries. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like we discipled each other. We kind of grew up together in the Lord as we met for this kind of an accountability relationship. And I'm still in touch with several of these guys today who continue to walk with the Lord. Paul told Titus to zero in on the quality of self-control or self-mastery. That is asking the hard questions about the thought life and fulfilling responsibilities as a husband and father. It's the young adult years when passions run hot in terms of the sex drive and the success drive. Young men are susceptible to overconfidence, cockiness, and recklessness. Young men can hold each other accountable for the spiritual disciplines like staying in the Word, being men of prayer, continuing in fellowship, making sure that worship is a priority in their lives, getting invested in ministry, stewarding their resources well, and sharing Christ. And I'm delighted to see young, middle-aged, and older men all participating in Aspire on Sunday night. Because it shows that there's a desire to make this more of a spiritual leadership thing a greater priority in their own lives. Paul goes on to tell Titus that how he lives and teaches is just as important as what he teaches. In other words, he is to model, he is to demonstrate the message in his own life. Investing himself in doing good deeds for others, to be a do-gooder, 
Passages like that challenge me to make sure I'm prepared as I stand before you every week. That I'm prepared mentally, but I'm also prepared spiritually. As I come to this point in the message, these words from Jesus come to mind. John 16, 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. So we're going to move on. I want to make sure that we get the blanks filled in, because I know that's really important to some of you. Some of you just can't hardly live if not all the blanks are filled in, right? So we're going to make sure that we fill in all the blanks today. As we move from here to maturity, we need to act our age and also play your position. A couple of positions in life are mentioned here. As trustworthy employees, verses 9 and 10. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Those verses don't need a whole lot of interpretation because they're just pretty straightforward. They're pretty right on target. Assuming that we can compare the slaves, the slave to an employee, Paul instructed, in terms of our relationship with the people who are over us on the job, be subject to them. In other words, respect their higher position. Respect their authority. Don't resent it. Don't try to usurp it. Accept your current position. Accept your current position. Try to please them. This doesn't mean flattery. doesn't mean expensive gifts to curry favor. Rather, it's helping them succeed. <clears throat> you're committed to helping them succeed. You're committed to helping them fill their agenda, to advancing their goals rather than simply your own. Make every effort to understand what those desires and goals are. What is it that your boss, your supervisor, the company owner, what are they trying to accomplish? What are their goals? You're there to help them do that, to further their agenda. That's why you are there. Don't talk back to them. That is being argumentative. Making excuses. Taking exception to their direction. That happens so much. Sometimes we put it in a generational type of a thing. The millennials have taken big hits and we talk about, yeah, that sounds like millennials. Let me tell you, it sounds like young men to me. Sometimes we have that tendency to do that. But then some guys never outgrow it. Always arguing. It doesn't matter what direction is given by those who are in authority. They always take exception. Always take exception. Let's talk about a better way to do it. And on and on it goes. Now, I do believe that there's a place when we establish a healthy relationship on the job where we can ask clarifying questions. Can you help me understand this better? And we may even go to the place where we can offer suggestions. Well, is it possible that we could do it this way? And that's fine as long as we do it respectfully, but especially finally accept their decision. So when we've made our suggestion, we've asked our questions, where we finally come to the place where we say, okay, but it's theirs to decide, not me. I'm not the decision maker here. I need to respect the one who is in that position. Now this is pretty basic. Don't steal from them. That includes money, supplies, clients, and time. When employees or subordinates prove trustworthy, it enhances our Christian testimony. If you want a good case study of that, read all about Joseph in the Old Testament and see the way that he honored even some pretty tough leaders, some pretty tough rulers, and God honored him as a result. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I took this out of the Amplified. The Amplified version, you know, has got <clears throat> several different words that are kind of thrown into the passage to kind of clarify. And it says it like this, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are good and kind, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if a person endures the sorrow of suffering unjustly because of an awareness of the will of God. Well, let's take a close look at another important position we play, and that is as cooperative citizens Flip over to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be 
ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. Now, given the reputation of the Cretans that we've talked about, it's no wonder that Paul would include this instruction on submission to authority, and specifically to the authority of government. Our submission to government officials can be both passive and active. Active obedience means obeying the laws, following the procedures, paying the taxes and fees, assisting them wherever we can. Passive obedience means refusing to slander them, giving consideration to their perspective, showing deference to their position. As citizens of a democracy, we have been given privileges and rights which need to be used wisely and peacefully, just as Paul used his rights as a Roman citizen. Ask yourself, Christian, if you have developed an attitude about government, an attitude about authorities, about police officers, about town councils or judges, the governor, congressman, the president, especially he's, if he's from the opposite political party. Don't let your personal rights overshadow your Christian responsibilities as a citizen and especially as a witness of Jesus Christ. Christian maturity includes being cooperative citizens, providing a unique service for our government leaders. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Pray for rulers and for all those who have authority so that we can have quiet and peaceful lives full of worship and respect for God. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to know the truth. Let me tell you a secret. Both Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi need our prayers. They need our prayer support a lot more than they need our criticism. They need our prayer support. We need to be lifting them up to the Lord rather than wasting all of our time grinching about what they're doing. As you take out the connection card today, I want you to listen once more. Think about these two things that we've talked about. Act your age. Act your age. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men and play your position as an employee, as a citizen. On that connection card, there may be some specific things, maybe something that's kind of been bubbling up, kind of plowed up a little bit as we've gone through a pretty practical section of Scripture. And um, maybe there's some special prayer requests that you'd have in that regard, maybe some things going on in your family, maybe some people, maybe you struggling in one of these areas, struggling struggling in one of these relationships. We need to take it seriously if we're going to truly mature in Jesus Christ. So important that we do that. Let's bow together. Jesus, this is one of those really kind of between-the-eye passages. It doesn't deal in in, uh, vagaries. Some pretty specific instruction that's given to those believers who truly want to move from wherever they are toward greater maturity. And I hope, Lord, that that's true of everyone in this room. That we want to take steps forward rather than offering excuses for our infantile or childish behavior. We really do want to move forward. And Lord, I also know that as we're going through a section like this, that, that the easiest thing is to see all kinds of illustrations and applications to other people. People come to our mind, boy, that person violated this one and they violated that one. Lord, I pray that we'll make this very personal as your word comes to us, as we're responsive, as your Holy Spirit takes the truths of this and kind of bears in on an area or two that we need to grow in, that we need to take steps in. So Lord, I pray that this will not be a time when we're simply hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And Lord, it would just seem right 
that we would uh, also pray for those who are in authority over us right now. We pray for President Trump. And we pray for Nancy Pelosi. They represent two extreme opposites on the political spectrum from our country. And yet both are in duly elected positions of authority. And Lord, I pray that we will give them the respect and the prayer support and whatever encouragement we can along the way. And Lord, I know how that is hard to do when we disagree with stuff, things that they're doing or ways that they're living. But right now, Lord, I pray that we'll respect them for the position that you place them in and be those good Christian citizens that you've caused us to be. Jesus, use this as a time that we truly are growing one step at a time. Lord, also at this time, we, uh, we want to be obedient to one of the things that you've instructed us to do, and that is to be good stewards of the resources that, <clears throat> that actually belong to you. And that means right off the top, our tithes and offerings, which we bring and invest in the cause of Christ here at Bethel and around the world. And so, Lord, I pray that this is something that we do in obedience, but that we also do it with joy as we serve you in this way. And I pray this in the strong name of Jesus, because he is the one.